Picture the Middle Ages. What are you imagining? Is it a magical, vibrant and colorful period of chivalrous knights, heroic deeds, beautiful princesses and mythical creatures? Or maybe it's rather a grim and dreary period of poverty, disease, intellectual darkness and fanatical violence. Both perceptions have some truth and some falsehood to them, and they are often held together despite the contradictions between them. Both of them are also these days influenced greatly by films. However, to understand the origins of this dichotomy, and to be able to separate truth from fiction about the Middle Ages, we need to go back long before the advent of cinema. Of course, the concept of the Middle Ages did not exist during that period. In fact, it's quite a problematic term. We treat the Middle Ages as a single period in history, but it spanned about a thousand years, from the fall of the Western Roman Empire to the discovery of America by Columbus. That means that for someone living towards the end of the Middle Ages, the beginning of that period was as distant as the Norman invasion of England is to us. So, by lumping all those centuries together, we obscure the great variety and richness of the different cultures within that period. And the reason we do that is because of post-medieval thinkers. Renaissance authors dismiss that whole millennium as the Dark Ages between them and the Classical period. And a similar sentiment was articulated by the rationalists of the Enlightenment who condemned what they considered superstitions of the past. So modern man has this, this you know, kind of uh, self-inflated uh, importance that uh, we, th we think we're better than those who came before us. You know, we're more uh, educated, we're more enlightened, we're more civilized or mm -hmm. whatever. The Protestant Reformation also played an important role in that process. The reformers wanted to separate themselves from the church, and they did that by spreading lies about the Catholic-dominated medieval world. It was no coincidence that printing was invented and spread fastest in the countries most sympathetic to the Reformation, the German states, England and the Low Countries, where this press in Antwerp still survives. With their new technology, the Protestants could fight a different kind of war. For the first time, it was possible to wage a real propaganda campaign. And so the myths about the Crusades, Inquisitions, and the general state of medieval life are repeated to this day. And yet, that's not the only way that memory of the Middle Ages survived. It was also immortalized in folk traditions and stories. The distant Middle Ages have throughout the centuries offered people a mystical past to hearken to, and medieval tales of great heroes and their deeds were passed on through generations, whether that's Robin Hood, Beowulf and King Arthur in England, or El Cid in Spain. Most European countries have traditional stories which have their origins in the Middle Ages, although they are often largely influenced by later traditions which don't necessarily have historical accuracy in mind. The Middle Ages are also often tied to national identity. Victor Hugo wrote a lot about late medieval French culture in The Hunchback of Notre Dame, and in occupied Poland, Henryk Sienkiewicz wrote the novel Krzyżacy in which he presented the historical Polish victory against the Teutonic Order as a way to strengthen the hearts of Poles while avoiding censorship. And yet, already, what we see there is not necessarily faithfulness to historical truth, but the creation of a new history, useful to the people telling it. So, both the negative and positive depictions of the Middle Ages in culture are in a large part fabricated, or at least tainted by the ideologies of later generations. This process of the continual creation of the medieval period after it ended is called medievalism, and it is exactly what we see when we look at medieval films. In the early days of cinema, it was mostly the second type of medievalism that dominated. Folk tales were being adapted to this new medium without much concern for historical authenticity. 
But a very interesting and important example is the 1928 French silent film The Passion of Joan of Arc, directed by Carl Theodor Dreyer. It was made shortly after the canonization of Saint Joan, when she was a very important character to French patriotism. The film features striking cinematography. It is almost entirely composed of close-ups. Therefore, we don't actually see much of the sets and costumes, which in many films are the first things that may jump out as historically inaccurate. And what we do see, the story, is accurate. It's based on actual court records of the trial of Joan of Arc. But most importantly, the emotions are accurate. The incredible performance from René Jean Falconetti puts us in that world because we recognize the humanity of the characters. As film history progressed, medieval films continued to be popular, and they utilized the development of sound and color to depict the vibrancy of the period. But a change came around the middle of the century. Darkness began to dominate depictions of the Middle Ages. The Seventh Seal is a 1957 Swedish movie directed by Ingmar Bergman. It tells the story of a knight returning with his squire from a crusade to find Sweden overrun by plague, poverty and extremist penitential movements. Now, even just from that description, we can tell that this movie is not interested in presenting an accurate image of a specific period. After all, the Last Crusade ended a century before the Black Death spread across Europe. But Bergman chose to combine both real and exaggerated features of medieval history as background to explore 20th century philosophical questions. And I do think that approach succeeded in this aim. Another very interesting example is the 1986 film The Name of the Rose. It's an adaptation of a novel by Umberto Eco, a medievalist who set a murder mystery in a fictional medieval abbey. The movie's cinematography and art design, as well as exceptional acting, definitely suit this dark story. And in several scenes medieval customs are depicted and the richness of manuscripts is shown. And yet the film also plays into many stereotypes. Several of the monks, and especially the peasants, are presented with exaggerated features, dirty faces and torn clothing. And the richness of medieval art and philosophy, which Echo spends so much of his book describing, are often skimmed over for the sake of creating a creepy and dark atmosphere, like in this scene. The silent speech of the carved stone dazzled my eyes and plunged me into a vision that even today my tongue can hardly describe. I saw a throne set in the sky and a figure seated on the throne. The crown on his head was rich in enamels and jewels. The purple imperial tunic was arranged in broad folds over the knees, woven with embroideries and laces of gold and silver thread. The face was illuminated by the tremendous beauty of a halo containing a cross and bedecked with flowers while around the throne and above the face of the seated one, I saw an emerald rainbow glittering.
But the biggest inaccuracy that the film engages in is the depiction of the Inquisition, which already was a bit exaggerated in the novel, but in the movie it's taken to the next level. Not when faced with such irrefutable evidence. A witch! Bernard de Gouy, a historical character, together with the entire Inquisition, are presented as bloodthirsty and cruel villains. Do you renounce the devil and embrace Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Having more in common with post-medieval characters or a Monty Python skit than actual history. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition! The parodies like Monty Python and the Holy Grail show how this trend of depicting the Middle Ages as dark and violent continued to be mainstream for the following decades. Bring out your dead! Here's one! Ninepence! I'm not dead! What? Nothing! Here's your ninepence! And it didn't change with the turn of the century. The film Kingdom of Heaven, directed by Ridley Scott in 2005, is an infamous example. It supposedly tells the story of Balian of Ibelin, and the siege of Jerusalem in the 12th century, but it has little to do with historical facts. France is presented as a colorless, famished land, even though it was actually a time of a renaissance in Europe. Medieval customs are ignored, for instance a bastard is accepted as an heir with no questions, which would not happen in reality. Arise, the night, I'm Baron of Ibelin. And most Europeans are presented as sinister and power-hungry maniacs or weak cowards. It is unfortunate about the people, but it is God's will. There will come a day, Renaud de Chatillon, when you are not protected by your title. Oh, when will that be? Who are those men? Muslims. Saracens. And they are allowed their prayers. If they pay the tax. Well, a tax for being Christian was also something found in Muslim-occupied territories. In general, the film has a clear contemporary message. None of us took this city from Muslims. No Muslim of the great army now coming against us was born when this city was lost. It presents the Crusades in a very negative light, simply as a Christian invasion of Muslim lands ignoring the historical fact that they were a response to centuries of violent Muslim conquests. Uh, I thought there was a great line here. We, uh, it was a Jonathan Riley Smith, one of the foremost authorities on Crusades today, remarked the film was Osama bin Laden's version of history. Yes. But the question arises, what makes this film's inaccuracies different from those of The Seventh Seal? Why was it received so much more negatively? It might be because it purports to depict actual historical characters and events. But it might also be because the story is simply less engaging. However, another important question is, does it have to be that way? Are historical inaccuracies inevitable? Certainly, an argument can be made that audiences are so used to those medievalisms that in a way they feel more medieval than actual history. But ultimately, I think there is value in presenting historical truth. And a great recent example is the film Outlaw King, directed by David Mackenzie. It tells the story of the Scottish King Robert the Bruce, and its contrast to films like The Kingdom of Heaven is striking. From the first scene, we are shown clean and colorful costumes, richly decorated interiors, The film also depicts authentic medieval customs, even obscure ones. By these swans, I vow to avenge this murderous insult to God! And it's not like it shies away from violence and darkness, but it's there when it's appropriate. Of course, there are some historical inaccuracies and simplifications, but it comes far closer to depicting the real Middle Ages than most movies. I believe that this is one of the reasons why it's a good movie. After all, it's much easier for us to empathize with the characters if we see that they are real people, not idealized or villainized stereotypes. The history of depicting the Middle Ages in cinema is a fascinating topic. There are many approaches that filmmakers have taken throughout the years, 
But one trend which has been always present is the understanding that the medieval period is useful. It's so long and varied that it can be used as background to tell stories relevant to the thoughts and beliefs of writers. But I do think that it's good when care is given to accuracy. It can help audiences really understand this rich and diverse period from which so much of our civilization has come.